Marcus Owens trained as an architect, works as an environmental consultant and design anthropologist, and is currently a PhD candidate at University of California, Berkeley, College of Environmental Design, in affiliation with the Berkeley Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society. And I believe he's also a visiting researcher at UCLA Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics. So would you please join me in welcoming Marcus Owens. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to Sue and uh, everybody for coming. Um, <clears throat> just a little background on the project um, and, and, what, and what I'm trying to do here. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, one of my advisors is Jennifer Walsh out at UC Berkeley. Um, some people here referenced her, her, her book, uh, Animal Geographies, and some of her papers on uh, urban animals, some of her books. And so this project that I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, sprung, sprung out of a paper we wrote together. Um, look, trying to understand, trying to under well first off we were writing a, a book chapter about a, sort of a, it was a handbook for human animal studies and we were just doing an overview of urban animals and in the course of writing that we kind of, we were talking about sort of the different ways in which designers approach uh, animals and design and so this kind of drew out of that discussion we just and and so what I'm going to talk about is sort of the empirical matter of this of this paper we're working on. We're, we have it up for publication now, <clears throat> and then I'm also going to try to situate the sorts of approaches that I do that are a little bit different different than what uh, Jennifer does, and um, and and what that is is um, rather than taking a, a geographical a geographical approach or a planning approach necessarily, you know, as, as was mentioned, I work in the, the uh, <clears throat> With the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society, and so, and my my background is also uh, more in design. So, um, what, what I'm more interested in doing is, uh, and what I do in my own research, which I'm going to try and work in a little bit in here with the empirical matter that Jennifer and I uh, uh, did together, and that is trying to understand the relationship between design, uh, science, technology, in other words, knowledge and power, and design aesthetics, and how those things meet in relationship to animals. Um, <clears throat> And what sort of research? What are the implications for research? So um, we'll see how it goes. Kind of, kind of mixing, mixing two things in some ways here, or emphasizing, trying to work in my research. So to, to begin with the empirical matter, <clears throat> uh, what we did was, what we started is we were interested in sort of understanding where can we go to 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 to, to find animals in in design, and we went to the internet just because you know design is not like academia where things are are published in a in a, in a regular way. So, one of the things we, that we needed to think about, and that you know, is is, is uh, embedded in my work, is trying to understand um, what are the implications of the internet for uh, design practice and for animals. I think people here were talking about the notion of um, affective apparatus, uh, which I think is really really fascinating, and this notion of the libidinal, libidinal, the, uh, libidinal economy of the internet, the attention economy of the internet. Um, and how that relates more broadly to processes of urbanization, capital accumulation, uh, and space. So it's not just a question of the internet. And so finding animals design clickbait or star attack. So this also uh, transforms design practice um, within within design practice. I'm sure the architects here in the room will understand, uh, will you know recognize sort of how design practice has shifted in tandem with the internet. This notion of the star architect, the Bill Bow effect on urbanization. Uh, you know, Rem Koolhaas has bemoaned the decline of the architect as a public figure, and you know the the, the function of design practice uh, increasingly as a sort of um, brand building exercise for cities, um, and so that also changes how we how we inhabit cities. <clears throat> so, um, just beginning to try to quickly situate um, how I approach design, how I like to think about design in relationship to technology and aesthetics. Uh, moving into how that might engage with animals. Um, so, you know, without getting too deep into Ranciere, um, the, the, the Ranciere's philosophy of, uh, of art and aesthetics, um, essentially, he talks about, um, and, you know, there's all sorts of uh, anthropology and technology and design that have their own takes on this, but just sort of the takeaway is that um, the modern notion of aesthetics and art and the modern notion of design that is, you know, embedded, embedded therein. Uh, Ranciere talks about the ethical, representative, and aesthetic, and you know, are we still in the aesthetic regime? Something may be changing, but essentially, this no notion that design is grounded in this uh, 
design is embedded in this um, relationship between working and uh, envisioning. And so this notion of design from disegno, this Renaissance notion of drawing, envisioning the plans, uh, it has to functionally work, but it's also embedded in this regime of modern art and aesthetic representation, uh, aesthetic philosophy that is related to sense, sensibility, class distinction, and so on. <clears throat> so we can understand that design is operating between this functional technology, the aesthetic arrangement of technological artifacts, um, and so it's also embedded in this regime of this, uh, modern regime of aesthetics. Okay, so animals in design, thinking about animals, learning design in animal studies. Um, this is kind of where I'm trying to situate myself and how, how, how we begin to approach the paper. So essentially, if we want to talk about modern architecture, really sort of broad overview of some of the architects in the room, uh, you know, may find this very simplistic, but essentially, you know, Henry Ford and the assembly line, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it can, we can understand that as a modernism, modern design as a way of organizing the world, the Maison Domino, the Machina Habite, uh, Lord Corbusier's nation of the machine for living. So, um, and, and, this, and this has implications for design. Essentially, when we, when we try and think about the rise of ecology and design, um, it's, a, it's a sort of critiques of um, where, where animals start to come into design uh, and, you know, situating this moment within the history of science. These are some texts that I'm working with, The View from Above by Jean Hafner. This is, in, this is about um, Lefebvre, the rise of this notion of social space, these sorts of critiques of uh, Saya modernism and dividing the city into functional, yeah, they have four functional areas, uh, work, recreation, circulation, and um, work, recreation, what was the fourth one? Architects. <laughs> work, recreation, circulation, and uh, recreation, work, live, circulation, that's four. Right. And so um, the basic notion was this is based on economic functionalism, the functional city. And then, of course, we have these mid-century critiques that emerge along with, you know, second order, order cybernetics, which is what uh, Or Halpern right here in the middle is talking about in her book, um, Vision and Reason, and then sort of second modernism along with second order cybernetics uh, describes, you know, this moment at MIT, uh, you know, we have uh, the develop, uh, Jay Forrester just in time, Manufacturing is the modes of economic production. Um, the integration of social science research into design, so it's no longer about simple economic functionality. The rise of urban design that supersedes urban planning, and so on. So, um, I, what I'm so what I'm trying to do is understand these transitions um, and understand the role of social science in design in, in, in this sort of in, in this period. So. This is where Kevin Lynch comes out, where you know essentially subjectivity, what Or Hoplin argues, is sort of subjectivity as a as as a as, as a as a new objectivity and prediction as a mode of um, as, as as a mode of design based on prediction. So this leads into you know it's no longer about uh, designing discrete objects, but beginning to design experiences based on you know user research, focus groups, these sorts of these sorts of methods. <clears throat> And so, and, and also information technology, uh, second order observation, and so on. So this is sort of trying to begin to situate how animals come in, and also what happens to humans uh, during these processes. So, biosemiotic design. We uh, Sue, Sue and I met at the uh, biosemiotics animals and the Anthropocene conference, and a lot of my work specifically looks at how uh, information technology, um, you know. And these new modes of production associated with information technology relate to uh, <clears throat> design practice and, 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 and what happens with animals there. So that's sort of the a, approach to how I'm trying to situate myself these would be uh, design in animals and science and science studies. So here's the empirical matter of the survey that Jennifer and I did. So we, we got about a little bit over 100 projects. I think, I think we, you know, sort of like we did a, an intensive sort of web scrape and, um, you know, we, we still update it sometimes, so I'm not sure if it's completely updated, but <clears throat> basically you can see that there's a vast, uh, there's a vast uh, unevenness in terms of who, what, what types of animals we design. So, 
Um, 12 for birds and bats, 12 for dogs and cats, the vast majority for vertebrates, um, 12 for anthropods, and 2 for mollusks. And this is something we've talked about in, this, in, in, in here before, sort of like which animals get designed, what sort of knowledge is produced and mobilized for design, and um, what do those designs do. So that's sort of a first takeaway uh, for the project. And then um, sort of to, to get back to, to, uh, to how, how, we, uh, <clears throat> how we process the results, and this is going back to the sort of notion of the second modernism, um, the, the uh, in critiques, of, critiques of modernity in the mid-century, critiques of new social movements, and so on. So this is the uh, tecton uh, penguin pool. It's a very famous, famous um, pool, uh, sort of the high modernist design for animals. And as you can see, this kind of relates to, um, you know, yesterday we were talking about the Uxcolian approach, you know, definitely sort of lax. What's going on here is, um, what's going on here is, uh, in terms of in terms of what I'm interested in is the design is acting as you know it's a social signifier it's sort of it's it's just sort of relates to this high modernist notion of design it's not actually engaging the animal sensory apparatus or uh, ethology or so on it's um, engaging with human sensibilities about um, design and uh, modernity and um, and so you know we see this can we continue to see this sort of approach to animals and design is some of the some of the designs we surveyed. You know, for example, here's a petting farm from Arch Daily. Uh, you know, obviously it's a it's a very good looking uh, to you know to our sensibilities uh, petting farm, but you know as far as animals are concerned, uh, it's pr pr pretty pr you know more or less right in the mill. You know, again these are some of these award winning projects that are featured on design blogs. <clears throat> again for the animals, you know it's a nice it's a nice vet for the animals. You know, they're probably different. Another thing that we are really interested in that you know, I'm not going to get too much into is you very rarely see cages on the... Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the few shots where you see cages. We also had a really hard time finding the area in the survey, um, even though obviously there's a lot of that, those designs. So something in the paper we talk a little more about is like what designs are really visible, what designs circulate on the internet, and these sorts of things. Um, and so another part of the uh, sort of modern design is the capacity to uh, envision. And there was definitely a lot of visionary projects where animals operate in sort of spectacular fashion. Uh, this is the uh, Buenos Aires Vertical Zoo competition, people swimming with dolphins and whatnot. <clears throat> so again, this is also in, in, in many respects embedded in that uh, modernist tradition of um, of you know visionary change revolution you know that goes back to sort of perspectival vision, <clears throat> um, so we have we have a number of these projects as well. Um, this one's sort of creeping into uh, I included this one in the Anthropocene discussion where we start to think about uh, designing habitats, designing worlds, um, and also the new modes of vision that were enabled by the uh, <clears throat> by uh, atmospheric research and you know you know the, the view from above as it were. Um, so, you know, you know, continuing along the sort of, uh, third quarter of the 20th century, and so here, here I, I put this one in because you know it's obviously visionary, the uh, Terraform One e House, uh, but this really kind of goes into I think when you we start talking about biotechnology and information technology um, belongs in a different category, but um, I have it in here for now. <clears throat> so, animalist habitat. Um, we in our paper we 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 discuss animals in the landscape and animals as habitat. Uh, you know, for my purposes, this is really embedded. So these are Ian McCard's drawings of, uh, you know, Ian McCard was part of this. We talked about him yesterday. He was referenced yesterday. Um, beginning to bring in ecological science um, into design is what he's, he's very well known for. And sort of the landscape starts to reemerge as a, as a mode of organizing space. Um, when the landscape, you know, in high modernism sort of falls to the backside, uh, it's sort of back around it. And again, so the influence of urban ecology, this is where part of my research is in Germany. You know, here we have, uh, you know, understanding the city in, in ways other than economic function, functionality. Here, here we have that here, the Tierwelt, uh, the animal world, sort of understanding the city as, as, as um, you know, as a, as a dynamic ecosystem. Um, and placing that in the scientific time. And, you know, the historical context, this is, this is the moment in which people are, um, you know, there's critiques of this sort of modernist organization of space. Uh, the mobilization of science and citizen science to oppose uh, top-down expertise in urban redevelopment, uh, <clears throat> oppose highway projects and whatnot in Berlin, and then where I'm from in San Francisco. Uh, that's a big part of how um, the city is organized and how we 
sort of part of the story, I think, of how we can talk about animals and sort of greening of the city uh, and how, you know, in the role of knowledge um, in those urban transformations. So, uh, you know, and now this sorts of meet in the contemporary, we have these sorts of urban ecologies and uh, scientific knowledge meets these new modes of production reflected in the internet. So we have this sort of stark architecture, hyper nature. This is uh, Michael Van Valkenburg won the competition for uh, the Arc Wildlife Overpass. And I think this goes back to, um, you know, talk, I think the internet is, uh, is very important to understand, uh, you know, contemporary social relations and also design practices is embedded in there. So it's sort of like, okay, um, you know, maybe uh, Ned Doddington is going to talk a little bit more about this. I'm going to kind of run through. But, you know, so we have different sorts of animals as habitat, sort of landscape urbanism, mobilizing, mobilizing life towards other goals, um, toward, you know, as functional outcomes in the landscape. Um, Understanding ecological perspectives on animals. This is a uh, Jeannie Gang's uh, Chicago uh, Calumet uh, Eco Center, which is also interesting. It's an ecological education center on a brownfield site. Um, so it's in, you know embedded within the larger landscape processes, and they're trying to use these. Uh, it's also sort of a very beautiful building. Um, okay, so. And this is where, uh, where so my, my, my research is a little bit more uh, embedded. And um, so the last category of animals in design. As skeuomorph as animal tactic is something I'm interested in. Skeuomorph is a, is a term coined by Donald Norman, which essentially, uh, it, it normally refers to, uh, it was originally developed as an archaeological term to refer to, you know, on this basket you have these non-functional design elements that refer to a previous function. So this is like a, a ceramic uh, bowl that looks like a basket. And so this is like a 19th century archaeological term. In design, it's, it's, it references, it's like deployed a lot in de user design research. Um, like Steve Jobs is really famous for really liking skeuomorphs. You know, for example, this phone on the iPhone that looks like it's a rotary phone, or you know, they're all over Apple products. <clears throat> so um, this goes back into sort of this notion of user design research and this, you know, second order modernity and mobilizing uh, perception and subjectivity towards, towards objective outcomes. Uh, we talked a little bit about Longusco yesterday, and this is that you know I'm just interested in thinking about the skeuomorph mobilized and design and sort of where that comes from. So, Longusco's diagram about the the bird who thinks it sees a dead bird and then, you know has the same sort of functional response uh, from seeing that 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 rag. And so you know here's Longusco's functional circle, second order cybernetics with Wiener, uh, Norbert Wiener, and uh, Gregory Bates and Margaret Mead. <coughs> And just you know, looking at how those things are uh, mobilized and designed, and actually, um, and so we have you know various design practices. Natalie Germanchenko was one person, someone who used more of a semiotic approach, understanding flows of information uh, as as sort of media for design intervention, uh, which is actually quite different than sort of this modernist notion of designing the city with expertise from the top down and so on. So we have a number of these projects. Uh, Natalie Germanchenko, Chris Woken, you know, essentially facilitating communication. This is something a, a speculative project I did. Okay, so finally, really quickly, since I'm out of time, where my work is based is, um, you know, so I'm interested in understanding, you know, the, the modes of production that are embedded within these social relations that are reflected in this. So do you guys all know what Mechanical Turk is? So Mechanical Turk is essentially, uh, it refers to um, what's artificial, artificial intelligence. So it's, it's, dividing, it's designing um, an interface through which two humans communicate. In some ways, it's like Uber. It's like... But it, it, it's, 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 it's deployed by Amazon, so some people in here have lots of, lots of data. Well, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, I'll show an example. You know, it's like Amazon Mechanical Turks allows people to um, allows you to use human uh, cognitive abilities for the only processes that algorithms and artificial intelligence can't can't do. Uh, so I'll explain that a little bit more. But it's sort of in many ways what people call like the future of work. Is sort of like what, what we may be doing in the future or our, or our children. And then there's also this notion of gamification, which is, which, is, which is different, but you know, a lot of times in Mechanical Turk operations employ gamification, which is a little bit more self-explanatory, but essentially targeting work activities to reward desired behavior. So, and so this goes back to thinking about the, like, the affective apparatus, the circulation of animal images on the internet, how those produce new designs. So this is part of one of my researches. These are people doing a mechanical, or mechanical Turk operation uh, for the Golden Gate Parks Conservancy. Essentially, they have all these wildlife uh, motion, motion detectors. 
and there's more data, as I'm sure some people in here know about, there's more images in the legal process. The, the algorithms can identify when there is an animal, uh, you know, the algorithms the, are able to identify what's in the image up to a certain point, but they, need, they really need humans to be able to look and identify, is this a squirrel or is this a fox, or you know, what, what, what exactly is going on here, and then they enter that in the data. So, this is how people are experiencing this part. This is interspecies interaction right here, and it's mediated by design. So, um, I just, what I'm trying to push forward is that the designers think more critically about, you know, the interspecies interactions also happen here, and they have very real world effects, because it's so, what happens when someone identifies a certain animal on here, what sort of power, uh, you know, what sort of what sort of power happens? In a, you know, sort of you know, this is happening. This discussion is happening. Sort of discussions about network cultures and whatnot. You know, the effective economy of Facebook and what happens when someone tweets or likes something. What happens when someone identifies a photo on here? Why is someone that why does someone go here and identify a photo on here? You know, and so and so where I work, you know, the they have motion. And I work in the Presidio is one of my research sites. They have motion detectors, motion detectors in all the trees, so they can go to their board of directors and tell them we have so many users here this year. So it sort of gets into the politics of data and moving away from this notion of um, perspective representation towards a, a, a new form of aesthetics. People talk about um, post-internet aesthetics where database has the database replacing perspective as a symbolic form of our time um, and sort of the mimetic, what makes something viral, what makes something circulate on the internet as opposed to this, this uh, modernist notion of aesthetics. Um, so that, that's, sort of, that's sort of what I'm trying to figure out here, and what, what I'm trying to examine, and how that impacts design, what sort of knowledge it is. Uh, and again, another, another sort of user-designed interface that, um, that I'm looking at is, this is a, uh, was designed at UC Berkeley, it's a citizen science thing called iNaturalist. It's sort of like a four-square uh, check-in thing. This is sort of like what I call gamification, where people try to, uh, you know, you get something by participating, uh, but also, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, when we participate in Facebook, for example, um, you know, there's some sort of effective labor there, but there's also an economy there. You know, I live in San Francisco, so it's very obvious that um, all these free services we get uh, are not actually free. You know, there's incredible a class conflict in San Francisco right now. They play down space in, uh, you know, in, in the urban environment. So. Another gamification exercise, I had a video for this, this is the Silkworm Pavilion. Uh, essentially this is, uh, at MIT they, they used a robot to spin a thread. It was a really great video, but I don't have the internet here to play it. And then the Silkworms build the Silkworm Pavilion. So I'm sort of interested in thinking about that. How, how, do we, how, do we, how, how does that help us think about gamification? Uh, and the effective economy of uh, the effective economies of you know, contemporary contemporary life, where the animals are sort of the design happens in permitting the animals to go about to build this thing, and then you know it's displayed in the lobby at MIT. You know, so uh, what's what, what's the economy there, and what's and what's the relationships of power and knowledge that sort of intersect there? And again, so, so just to close here, thing about time. Um, Peter Slaughter that talks about rules for the human zoo as these the sorts of new modes of governance that are emerging in sort of con contemporary life. And then, you know, just closing with this image, we have Bjarke Ingels' new Google headquarters, and then Bjarke Ingels' Gibskun Zoo. And um, the whole point of the Gibskun Zoo is that the animals don't know they're in the zoo, um, which builds off of, you know, developments in ethology from the past you know, 50 years, going back to botany school, but it's really being operationalized in new ways here and not just with animals. So I'll leave with that. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Marcus. Um, if you want to stay up here, we do have time for one or two questions before we move on to the next presenter. Um, so I'll open the floor if there are any questions for Marcus right now after that really thoughtful presentation. Sue? Yeah, um, really fascinating, very uh, rich talk, which I'm sure you could get a 40 minute talk. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I kind of threw yeah. a bunch of my own stuff there, yeah. and then Jennifer and I have this other paper, so. But my question, I mean, you could, it, I can't help think about um, uh, Bruno Latour and the Democracy of Objects, and I'm really interested in the uh, Wildlife Camera Project, and are you, the way it maybe articulates the between proximity and distance, and maybe s 
satisfies the need for proximity, but also I'm thinking back to the, the comments that um, John Didion made um, uh, yesterday about the need for very, very site-specific understanding and long histories. And I'm wondering, when these things start to flow around the internet, how does that, if like you're satisfying the need for proximity, but you're also displacing context, and I'm wondering if you've thought about that. Yeah, I mean, well, in terms of the, the wildlife camera project and the whole sort of citizen science, like the place of citizen science within the sort of broader sort of socio-technical apparatus, um, it's interesting because I talk, you know, that knowledge, I mean, when you, when you talk to people at the Golden Gate Parks Conservancy, which is the public-private uh, management agency of that, of that particular area, it's really about sort of producing desire. You know, I mean, the scientific knowledge is, you know, they, don't, they have their own ecological monitoring projects that they use to justify the things they're doing there. Because, um, you know, they, so they have this agenda that was brought down from them, this nature conservation agenda. And so the more ecological knowledge they have about the area, the more valuable that it becomes. And so that's true. But the citizen science stuff, you know, I don't know how, that's what I'm trying to figure out, that knowledge is really considered to be valuable, or is, is, is this more about the sort of gamification or um, participation as a, to, to mobilize, you know, support for the uh, conservation project. Um, now, in terms of the, um, the cameras and this notion of um, interaction, I mean, I think it's interesting in some respects because, I mean, I think one, one of the interesting takeaways from this conference for me is that we see these practitioners and they say, you know, design should actually be about keeping these animals out because, you know, it's really these conflicts aren't good for anybody. Um, so in some sense, you know, these camera projects are really interesting because, you know, you know ostensibly they're, they're, you know, giving the scientists these knowledge, this knowledge to sort of better manage the area. Um, and so that's why I thought it was really interesting when we were talking about the raccoons yesterday, you know, that the amount of knowledge that we have about these urban raccoons is incredible. Um, that that, that, uh, she pers that uh, Sue McDonald uh, presented yesterday. So, so that, that was incredible, and it was like the CDC, the CBA paid for that. And so it's like, that seems to me to, you know, that, that's where all these YouTube videos of people being taken. People want to know more about these raccoons, and so now we know more about these raccoons, so now that allows us to make these other design interventions and incorporate that knowledge into design, and then, you know, that has implications for, uh, for power and control as well. So. That's sort of where I'm situated. I don't really have answers, but these are just the sorts. These are sort of my methods for approaching and situating design, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis animals and ecology and urban space. So, we have time for one more quick question. Yes. <coughs> it's a kind of methodological question, almost. So, yeah, I'm taken by this idea of this um, kind of media ecology of animals that circulate you know, on YouTube or in design. Sort of break down what animals are on YouTube. You get this you know, very stark kind of narrow taxonomy. Uh -huh. How do we how do we look at what if any consequences that has in the real, so to speak, you know, on, on the ground? I mean, you know, it, it would be easy to dismiss this as a sort of as almost a virtual thing that goes on elsewhere. Uh -huh. in, in your own work, how are you tracking the way that this comes to shift people's subjectivities or ecological practices? Do you find it works through a particular? Yeah, so in, in, ter in terms of my, my, my own work um, uh, that, I'm, that I'm in the middle of doing right now, uh, the first component is to do the sort of, that's what I'm going to do now in UCLA, the sort of cultural analytics, to sort of try to sort of understand um, what exists out there in terms of in the, in the sort of online sphere and what, you know, what are the sort of contours of this attention economy. And then that's going to be followed up with sort of, um, a sort of anthropology of science discussion with experts about how, what they see the issues are, and then a sort of more traditional participant observation uh, sort of thing. So that's that's sort of going to be my methodological approach for the, moving forward with the uh, specific research on the uh, Presidio and uh, Templehof Airfield, which is the other site I'm looking at. Uh, if you have any suggestions, I'm just getting started. So. I mean, it's, it's hard because you know, we, we can make these wonderfully grand claims about the, the shifting media ecologies, mm -hmm. but as a sort of social scientist, you always kind of want to know what the empirical consequences are, uh -huh. and, and you know, it's maybe really monitors mm -hmm. the consequence of all these cats popping up on YouTube is, mm -hmm. cats worldwide, or the, uh -huh. well, the, yeah, the absences in that way. Well, the, the, in, in terms of uh, my specific empirical cases, um, in both the case of Templehof and the Presidio, they had um, you know, really big sort of star architect competitions, big international uh, celebrity architects come in. 
And they also had extensive uh, online pu public engagement. So the Presidium used Twitter and like proprietary platforms. And then um, in Germany, they had their own sort of open source platform, which is also, I think, is interesting. You know, those, the sort of design of those two platforms. Uh, and so, yeah, did those public engagement platforms do anything? How does that relate to sort of the broader um, media ecology? And how does that relate to sort of the experience of the space? So, the, so I mean, those are sort of open questions. I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to tease out those nuances. But um, yeah, it might just be that they're not doing anything. But I think there's certainly um, whether or not there's more or less animals there or whatnot. I mean, there's certainly. Um, I mean, in, in the Bay, you know, there's certainly in the Bay Area of spatial, you know, the sort of speculative internet economy of San Francisco, you know, whether or not any of it's real, it's definitely, you know, experienced by people living in the city, you know, the Google buses and the extreme gentrification and wealth inequality. So, you know, maybe it's all going to crash tomorrow, but, uh, you know, today's the Super Bowl in the city right now, and they shipped out all the homeless people, you know, so it's like, these, these things are, are grounded in material processes for sure. So, you know, the... Um, you know, what exactly is that relationship between the, the speculative internet economy and uh, the material processes in space? I mean, it's, it's not completely clear, but something's going on there.